Hello, welcome to at and Threat Track. Today we're going to discuss some security predictions for 2014. I'm joined today by Jim Clausing, John Hogaboom, and I'm Brian Repsrode. And uh, so, John, tell me, what do you think is going to happen next year? Uh, so my first prediction that I would um, kind of interject out there is that the stars are aligning for the whole bring your own device type of activity to become a real problem uh, in your enterprise. So if you don't have a action plan already around bring your own device, I would strongly suggest you start looking into it for next year. Um, what we're seeing with bring your own device is that you know, a lot of people are bringing in wireless and mobile devices from home, their own personal devices. Um, companies are allowing people's personal devices onto the network. And we've seen other activity where, you know, some of these devices have gotten backdoor trojans on them. We talked about, you know, some of the Android mobile malware out there. These could be gateways into APT type of attacks where, you know, that's their initial way in, in terms of getting, um, you know, getting a foothold into your enterprise. Maybe they do it on the outside while the device is, you know, connected to the regular network. And then once they're, the person comes into work, now they're on the inside and they can either get data. And you also have to be concerned about, on a personal device, somebody, you're, you know, one of your employees might be uh, keeping company information on their personal device. So, you know, those are some areas that I would be uh, concerned about and should be looking into uh, for 2014. Yeah, absolutely, John. I agree with you. In fact, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, Michael Singer brought up in last year's predictions was actually uh, this notion of migrating security in the cloud. And I think there's a close relationship to migrating security into the cloud as well as or, or migrating applications into the cloud. And, uh, and this BYOD in the sense that as things become mobile, they're basically outside of the enterprise environment, and unless you have a good policy, device management, and a strategy for BYOD, uh, you basically are setting yourself up for security problems. If it's well planned out, I don't see a security problem here. It's just a matter of making sure the right technology and policy and planning is in place to be able to support it. The thing about the data is you, you really need to keep that segregated to the extent possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the business data from the personal data, you don't really want to mix those, whether that's some sort of, you know, silo on the device or whatever. And that is, that is where I'm not sure that the, that the technology is really up to where we want it to be yet. Yeah, well, you're always <clears throat> struggling with security not being quite where we want it to be, isn't it? Aren't we? That's true. <laughs> Uh, very good joint. Okay, so John, what else do you think is going to happen next year? Um, so the other one that I was thinking about, uh, again, the stars are aligned. We've already seen indications of this in the past previous years with Shamoon and whatnot, um, but more incidences of destructive malware. Um, we've also even seen a crypto locker. Crypto locker is what I would consider destructive. Um, so I, I I think that we're going to see more of that. I'm not happy. I don't really want this prediction to come true, uh, but I, um, I fear that it will. And uh, so I guess we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So with CryptoLocker, we saw some uh, significant develops, and this was a case where they're basically holding your data for ransom. And, you know, if, uh, if, the, <laughs> if using your analogy, if the stars align, you get your data back. But uh, we also, as you might point out with Shamoon, that was a case where, uh, the malware is intended to actually be destructive, um, um, basically uh, per, perhaps covering the tracks of some sort of uh, other type of activity that might have been taking place. So uh, absolutely we should be uh, paying attention to what can be happen, happening. Not, You know, we've been concerned about data theft in the APT space very significantly. Uh, Standard reported that topic last year, and here we are uh, taking a much closer look at what could be done in a destructive sense uh, if... Uh, Somebody wanted to cover their tracks, for example, or somebody were uh, trying to really just sort of disrupt an operation. I have a couple of predictions for next year as well, and I think, uh, you know, we had talked last year, in fact, I think Michael Singer had proposed it or discussed it, uh, related to what he described as monster DDoS attacks on the order of about 100 gigabits per second as uh, perhaps being the uh, uh, what we'd experience. You know, at the time, we were kind of working through the, uh, a lot of attack activity that was uh, predominantly targeting financial institutions. Uh, since then, that activity seems to have let up, but uh, there still are 
some significant developments in the denial of service attacks. One that we're seeing is uh, what I would describe as commercialization of denial of service attack capabilities. Uh, there, we've talked about these before, uh, stressor services or um, uh, uh, blocker services, where basically you can buy a denial of service attack uh, through sort of a gray community or a gray market type activity. Uh, these operators of this service allege that or claim that it's a, a legal service, but denial of service attacks themselves certainly are not legal services in themselves or, or legal to be conducted. So what we're seeing is more and more frequent attacks. We've broken new records on a monthly basis almost associated with DNS reflection attacks. And then on top of that, we've also seen significant increases in the sizes of attacks. I think we saw one uh, that well exceeded 100 gigabits per second. So. Uh, I think we're going to continue to see the uh, sort of new records associated with denial of service tax going forward in the next year or so. Yeah, pipes aren't getting any smaller, so. Well, that's absolutely true. The pipes are getting bigger as well. And uh, what that does is, um, you know, I guess one of the concerns that I would have is that uh, there are possibilities of more peripheral impacts associated with denial of service tax. That is, uh, targeting one. Uh, address, for example, but perhaps having some impact on uh, some peripheral things around it. Because uh, if your application only requires a, you know, a couple hundred megabits per second or even a couple megabits per second, uh, that may be all they subscribe to. But if they get a 100 gigabit attack, it may have uh, some significant effects on uh, those around them. Yep. Uh, the next one that I am uh, paying attention to, we've, again, not a new topic, but uh, certainly one that I see is uh, and, uh, still a growing one in, in no insignificant terms, is more and more devices are becoming internet connected. Uh, we had talked about a botnet last year that was uh, infecting DVD surveillance, or surveillance camera DVDRs. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, DVD players, TVs, uh, cars. Uh, home business and security, energy sensors, controls, thermostats, you name it, uh, right down the doorknobs and such that all become Internet connected devices in a sense. Uh, they may be going through some sort of a proxy server or source uh, of uh, some sort, but ultimately what they come down to is devices that have potential vulnerabilities uh, that may need to be patched. And uh, the smaller they become, the less significant they become, uh, the more likely that they don't have a good patch process around them. So. Uh, I am uh, expecting that as more and more devices become uh, Internet connected, uh, we're going to see more kinds of situations where even perhaps new types of vulnerabilities show up. And the other aspect of this I think is, is significant is uh, a lot of these embedded devices have uh, perhaps a, um, a middleware or you know, reuse of applications or reuse of software that uh, may actually get fixed in their distribution, whether it be an open source distribution or, 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 or the like, uh, but may not actually proliferate down to the end devices for quite some time. So uh, we may see vulnerabilities that are exposed and perhaps even exploits against things that uh, even though the vulnerabilities may be patched, uh, they may not actually get deployed to devices in a, in a timely fashion. So that's a, a risk that's going to continue to grow in my opinion. Yeah, and, um, you know, in terms of uh, the home type of devices, I'm kind of worried about that aspect because that's kind of an emergent field of the use, and there's a lot of security systems and security vendors out there that provide, um, you know, wireless connectivity, remote access to your home. Uh, I really fear and worry that a lot of those types of devices are vulnerable to exploit. Um, and therefore, you know, your security of your own home might be vulnerable to exploit as well. So um, that's something that I kind of see as a uh, trouble spot, in my opinion, something I worry about. A possibility. Absolutely. So, Jim, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I have uh, a couple of my own, uh, one of them related to, to the two that you just uh, gave. Um, and that's and and actually kind of related to the Michael Singer's last year DDoS one, I, uh, and that's using mobile devices uh, as as part of the DDoS infrastructure. Um, I actually kind of expected to see some of that this year, and and really haven't yet. But we keep seeing all this malware attacking. Um, 
uh, attacking Android and iOS devices, uh, and and I expect to see uh, folks start to try to harness these devices as well to contribute to, you know, our amplification attacks we're seeing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, like I said, I'm I'm kind of surprised that we haven't seen more of it already. Um, and and maybe there are reasons why it it doesn't work as well as I think it will. But um, I, that's one trend that I I kind of expect to see some happen next year. Yep, absolutely a possibility. And you know, I will chime in that we have seen a little bit of that. Uh, yeah, we have I, believe, I believe it's been an accident in, in at least one case. That I, they didn't realize they were uh, using mobile devices as part of the attack surface. Right. You, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we have seen a little bit of it, but uh, I, I anticipate seeing more of it. My final prediction for this year, um, and, and it's one that we've actually seen happening uh, over the last year or two already, is, is the migration of these botnets uh, to peer-to-peer -peer for command and control. Uh, you know, we've seen the zero access that's been showing up on our weekly top tens for you know more than a year. Mm -hmm. But I, I I really anticipate that nearly all of them are going to be going to peer-to-peer -peer rather than centralized command and control, um, which makes our job of tracking them that much harder and the job of shutting them down that much harder, and that's why I think they're going to go that way. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. When you look at, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer bot, the, well, basically the two most successful botnets out there right now, uh, Zeus Game Over and Zero Access, are both peer-to-peer -peer oriented. So, um, you know, if, you know, that past history is any prognosticator, you, you would think that most botnet operators would want to move to a peer-to-peer -peer framework because they tend to be more resilient to takedown efforts. Exactly. The resilience to takedown is, is why I think they're all going to move that way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've seen a lot of uh, techniques in the past to make uh, botnets more resilient to takedown using central command and control. And, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the activities have gotten much more aggressive at trying to do the takedown activities. You know, we... Uh, have uh, seen cases where uh, registrars have been uh, told to basically relinquish large numbers of domain names to be able to, to facilitate takedowns. And so it kind of forces the, uh, the more sophisticated bot botnet operators to go to peer-to-peer. -peer. And hopefully this has been a bit of a deterrent to some of the other uh, smaller botnet activities. That is, you know, we are starting to see a large proliferation of, of basically a lot of different botnets and it seems that it's um, it's gotten a little bit smaller. That is, uh, we're not seeing as, uh, them as prominent as in, in the past. And uh, the more sophisticated ones, the ones that are very um, determined to uh, operate botnets, have gotten more sophisticated. And like you said, are uh, using the P2P structure. All right. Well, thank you, folks. I think those are some good predictions for next year. We'll have to uh, look at them at the end of the year and see how we've done with that. Hopefully, we'll be wrong on all of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Everything's going to be hockey dory for the next year, so thumbs up. And uh, so, in any case, that's the show for today. If you have your own predictions or thoughts about our predictions, we certainly would be happy to hear from you on this. You can contact us through email at threattrack at list.att.com. Through Twitter, our handle is at threattrack. Uh, the threattrack video is available on the ATT Tech channel. It's att.com slash threattrack. It's also available on YouTube and you can subscribe to an audio-only version on iTunes. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I'd like to also, on behalf of uh, John, Jim, myself, and at t we'd also like to wish you a Happy New Year. Uh, I'm Brian Rextrode, and we'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, keep your network safe.